All right, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Beyond Compliance. My name is Aaron Bolshaw with Safety Chain Software and the moderator of Beyond Compliance. Today, we're talking about productivity, specifically about how using uh, statistical methods for both the process side and product optimization. I'm really, really excited about this. So uh, for those of you that don't know, Beyond Compliance is a periodic industry update for process manufacturers. The goal, pretty simple here, to bring you insights from around the market that shape the way you grow your business, deliver quality products to customers, and even safeguard our brands, right? Uh, and all of this, you've got to be uh, mindful, of course, improving yields and maximizing productivity. Uh, the webinar is sponsored by Safety Chain Software and uh, Safety Chain is the number one plant management platform trusted by over 1,500 manufacturing facilities to improve yield, maximize productivity, and ensure compliance. So to get started, want to make sure everyone understands uh, we can't hear you, but we do want to hear from you. So you're on mute. Uh, if you have a question, we'd love to field that. We'll save some time at the end of this uh, program to, uh, to, to get some of those questions to our, our presenter, but use the console to submit the questions to the presentation, okay? Um, and then, yeah, to answer everyone's favorite question, if you do want to get the slides, you want the recording from today, no worries. You just ask us. We'll get make sure you get that um, following this this presentation. So, with that, I do want to introduce our presenter today. So, uh, Elise Wax is the president of Integral Concepts Incorporated. Fantastically experienced. So, uh, 20 years experience applying stat methods uh, to optimize product designs and manufacturing processes. This is so cool. She puts both of these together for us today. Uh, areas of her expertise include design, implement, uh, experimentation, reliability analysis, uh, general stats. Uh, stat process control that SPC will get into pretty good today, uh, measurement system assessment, uh, and stochastic optimization. Uh, she has more degrees than um, many of us. <laughs> so two couple of graduate degrees in stats, industrial operations, and engineering, and uh, just an all-around great person. Elise, welcome to Beyond Compliance. Thank you, Aaron. It's nice to be here. Yeah, so, so my, my quant stats professor uh, in grad school, Dr. Shafai, really didn't appreciate my particular brand or approach to improving manufacturing productivity. So at least instead of analyzing flow and process and inputs and outputs uh, of our model assignments, right? I, I kind of short circuited it. I, I opted instead to devise simple incentive programs for the labor force and estimated those improvements from increased engagement which is precisely why integral concept exists to keep fools like me out of that side of the business so so welcome why don't you start out at least please tell us a little bit about integral concepts um, okay, so basically we be mostly do consulting. We also do provide some training, but we work on optimizing both product designs, whether it's um, a pharmaceutical or whether it's a medical device, an aerospace component. Um, uh, we optimize product design, so we help to design products very, very quickly to meet all performance requirements. And then we also work on the manufacturing operation, so both scaling up, especially in the pharmaceutical area, but also making sure that manufacturing processes can reproduce our designs with minimal variation. So that way we get um, very good quality and highly reliable products out into the marketplace and quickly. So my personal specialty happens to be optimization, which we're going to talk a lot about, um, but basically using industrial statistical methods. So we basically work in a wide variety of industries and um, we have a lot of fun working with our clients. We have some a really, really uh, great clients doing some pretty amazing things. So anyway, um, what I want to do is uh, kind of give you an agenda here. So we're going to talk about process and product optimization and some of the key statistical methods that we typically use. First and foremost, measurement system assessment. So um, we rely on data to make predictions about how products are going to perform um, and to make all kinds of assessments and decisions. And so if we don't have good measurement systems, our data isn't reliable, that's going to be a problem. So we start with that. We're also going to talk about statistical process control. Um, it's really important when you're in a manufacturing environment that your processes are stable and they're you know, predictable. Uh, and then if they're not, we wanna be able to catch that right away. 
We're also going to talk about making sure that processes are capable of achieving the requirements, that they conform to all the uh, important requirements. We're also going to talk about using designed experiments to very quickly speed up R&D. Um, I would say designed experiments are one of the quickest ways you can possibly learn, um, and they also allow us to develop predictive models that helps us optimize both products and processing, and sometimes even jointly both the product and the process, even at the same time. Um, we're not going to get into reliability analysis, but that's near and dear to my heart. Reliability analysis is all about using statistical methods for predicting how units are going to perform in the field and when and how they're actually going to fail in application. Um, again, that's near and dear to my heart. This particular talk we're going to have today is going to focus more on the first four bullet points here. Um, unfortunately, we're not, probably not going to have time to get into reliability, but we do a lot of work in that area. So let's talk about optimization. What is optimization? And basically, it is just making something as perfect or functional or effective as it can possibly be. Um, and so whether it's making a product do all of the things that we want it to do as, as great as possible, or whether we're talking about a process, making a process operate with minimal variation, minimal scrap, uh, minimal rework, um, that's what optimization is all about and almost all of our work is really around optimization. So let's talk about what we need to optimize. Um, the first thing that we need are really good measurement systems. And the, the first thing to note is all measurement systems have error, all of them. And so if we don't know how much error our measurement systems have, that can end up being problematic because it'll affect our decisions that we make. So we need to use um, some kind of a statistical methods that give us an indication as to how good the measurement systems are. We also have to understand what are the biggest factors that impact product and process performance. Um, there are millions of variables, um, both in our control and beyond our control, like environmental, um, that do impact product and process performance. And it is impossible to try to control and understand millions of factors. So we really have to understand what are the biggest ones that have the biggest impact. Um, and we use a lot of statistical methods to figure out what those biggest factors are. We also make, have to make sure that once we're in production, our processes are predictable. They have to be stable because if they just kind of change unexpectedly, even if they're still in spec, but they look different, that is potentially going to cause a problem. Um, we need to be able to detect um, statistical changes really, really quickly. Otherwise, we're not going to find out about something until it's too late and we already have a problem. Um, really, our whole goal working with our clients is to prevent problems, both on the product side and also on the processing side. So not just reacting to problems and fixing problems, but let's just prevent them all together. Um, and so there are a lot of tools we can use to do that. We also need to make sure that we are going to be highly capable of conforming to requirements. Um, so we have to make sure we do that. And then finally, with our clients, a lot of our clients are in incredibly competitive industries and they don't have, you know, three years to kind of work on developing a new product. They want to get a new product out to market from concept to market as quickly as possible um, while minimizing risk and making sure that what we launch is going to be safe and effective in the marketplace. So we need to use tools that are going to allow us to do that very, very quickly. So. Um, some optimization examples. One thing that I kind of deal with with my clients is when I ask them what is quality, I get kind of a lot of vague answers or very um, maybe subjective answers. And so what I'd like to do is kind of put out there a couple of definitions for quality that might make it less vague, uh, kind of more objective. So one definition of quality could be quality is closeness to target. So usually when it comes to a product or a process, we have some kind of a target uh, or a nominal value we want to hit. And the closer we are to that, the better the quality. Um, a lot of times companies measure quality by seeing whether something is in spec or out of spec. And so basically what they say is, well, if we get a measurement and it's within the specification, then we say it's good. And if it's out of specification, we say it's bad. And in their view, Quality really kind of has just two levels. It's either good, it's compliant, or it's bad, it's non-compliant. But I don't really like to look at quality like that, just binary, good, bad. I like to look at it more on a continuum and think about quality as the further we deviate from what a customer wants or what the product needs, the worse the quality. Um, so I kind of look at, like it that way. The other 
way that I look at quality, which is I think a little more objective is quality is all about minimizing variation at an acceptable level. So if you guys can see off on your screen, there are three um, little curves here. And basically we have LSL, which stands for lower specification limit and USL that stands for upper specification limit. And suppose that we had three potential suppliers that were going to supply us with something, a material or a component. And one of the suppliers, let's say the top one, has a distribution of measurements that look like this. So they're, they're centered at the target value, but their variability spreads and they use up the entire spec. We have a middle supplier, which is not centered at the target, but they have a lot less variation. And then finally, a third supplier, the bottom one, which is centered at the target and has minimal variation. So one thing I wanna think about is, um, if you were a manufacturer and all of your products came out identically and they were all used exactly the same way, the question is, when would they fail? And the answer is they would fail at the same time if they were identical or they would behave the same way if they were identical. But the reality is, is there is variation in everything. And so our products don't behave the same way in application um, due to variation. And um, when we think about our product performance or process performance, it is a function of a bunch of inputs. Our materials might vary, our equipment and tooling might vary, the methods we follow might vary, our people might not behave the exact same way, our environments in a plant may vary, or even our environments in a in usage environment might, might vary. And so as a result, we have variability in our outputs, variability in pro product performance. And I like to minimize that so that all of our customers have the same and good experience. And so when I look at the top graph off to the right again, and I look at that supplier, I think to myself, oh my, that supplier is using the entire tolerance and there's a lot of variation there. And once I bring that variation into my plant, I'm gonna be stuck with it. And not only am I gonna be stuck with all that variation, variation is gonna grow exponentially. So when I get stuff that's running on the high side, I might need to make adjustments in my processing or other components to account for it. And that's going to inflate the variability even more. So another way of looking at quality is quality is all about minimizing variation. And sometimes it isn't even so important if we're on the target, as long as we're minimizing variation at an acceptable level, it's a win for everybody um, because we can basically make things look as similar as possible, which is gonna mean less scrap, less rework, more consistent performance, less customer complaints and so on and so forth. So to me, quality is either closeness to target or quality is all about minimizing variation at an acceptable level. All right. Moving on, we're gonna talk about things that we commonly encounter in the real world. So um, I've actually been in hundreds of manufacturing plants and engineering centers globally. Um, and things that we commonly see are inadequate measurement systems. Um, that's, that's a problem because garbage in, garbage out, bad data, we can't make great decisions. Um, we see a lot of companies use trial and error to try to, um, in, in our data, try to um, design a product. Um, a lot of companies might have a poor understanding of how to use statistical process control. They're using charts that were invented in 1924, like IMR charts and XBAR R charts that are really not so appropriate in most modern day production systems. Um, or if they're using a relevant chart that is uh, effective for a lot of modern day production systems, they might be physically sampling incorrect or not using adequate sample sizes. Um, a lot of times when they're doing a capability assessment to make you know assessments of how well products are meeting spec they they don't really check whether uh, data meets the assumptions they don't know what distributions their data follows or they assume that their data follows a bell-shaped curve when most data is actually not bell-shaped um, and a lot of times people don't really focus on minimizing variation and uh, that's a problem because that's really really important because if all the products were identical they would behave the same way uh, for the most part and we would have very few problems and then we see a lot of companies do inadequate reliability testing, shelf life testing, and accelerated life testing to understand how products are ultimately going to perform in application over the long haul. So those are some of the things that uh, we commonly see. So 
there are lots of opportunities. Um, the opportunities that we see for manufacturers and engineering are designing and develop products cost effectively. So let's do it quick and with minimal cost. Let's reduce waste. Let's make sure that when we're collecting data, we do it in a way where we're going to maximize information. And let's make sure that we have the tools to analyze that data effectively. Um, let's figure out how to find manufacturing issues before we're making garbage, stuff that's non-compliant that we have to worry about quarantining or throwing out. And then let's make sure that we're going to base decisions on um, appropriate analysis of data. Um, I, mean, I hate to say it, but um, unfortunately, I know for sure this is in, in North America, sometimes we don't really get um, kind of a lot of industrial statistical education. And sometimes mm -hmm. the statistics education that we do get is either too theoretical or um, boring. Um, so sometimes <laughs> oh, there's a little bit of a weakness there. Um, so let's start out with the first topic, which is measurement system assessment. So why should we worry about our measurement systems? Well, because basically all the quantitative methods that I'm going to talk about depend on good data. Um, so whether we're using SPC, statistical process control, like I call it SPC, whether we're using that or whether we're just inspecting stuff or whether we're trying to assess um, how well we're meeting specs or whether we're decision making or whether we're going to try to produce predictive models, all of those depend on good data. And so that's why we need to make sure that we're going to do an appropriate measurement system assessment. So what is MSA? I use MSA as an abbreviation. Um, it is a method that we use to understand whether or not our measurement systems have adequate discrimination. And but what I mean by that is no two parts that we make are identical. And so a good measurement system will be able to see the variation in our parts. A lot of times when I go into a manufacturer and I see them collect data, I'll see like the same four or five measurements over and over again. 2.04, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.04. It's the same like three or four numbers or five numbers over and over again. And I, in my opinion, that is lacking discrimination because none of those parts are the same. And the fact that we keep calling a part 2.04, 2.04, all these different parts are all just being called 2.04, um, that's problematic because that measurement system can't or isn't discriminating between our units. Um, so we need to make sure that we have adequate discrimination. And then accuracy and precision have to do with Accuracy means on average, does it tell the truth? Does it read properly? And then precision has to do with um, variability or error. In other words, if I were to measure the same thing over and over and over again on the measurement system, would it give me almost the same result? Or would there be a lot of variation when I keep remeasuring the same thing? Um, so that's what precision gets at. And then there are a lot of other issues associated with measurement system um, as well. But we really need to understand our measurement systems or test methods, whatever it is we're using um, in our industry to make sure that we're going to get um, the relevant information that we need. So key aspects are going to be um, looking at all of these issues that I talked about, understanding variability, where does it come from, if there is error, um, ensuring we have the right discrimination, making sure that we set up our studies properly to make sure that, especially when we're near specs, we make sure that our measurement system is really good when we're near a spec at consistently calling it in or out when things are borderline, making sure that we can understand all the statistical output when we're doing these assessments. You know, everyone talks about our gauge and ours. Um, and then we get all these, um, you know, statistical goulash out there in the session windows of our software package, but making sure that we can understand that statistical output and understand what it's telling us about the measurement system so we can understand whether or not we need to upgrade our measurement systems at all or whether they're actually very effective and we don't have a, a problem with them. Um, a lot of my clients think, oh, you know what, I just have a pass-fail mentality. Something I make is either good or bad. Um, I kind of like to kind of get beyond that and make things more quantifiable so that um, we can actually use a lot less data when we do that and actually make better decisions. Um, no, there are lots of issues I can go on and on about measurement system forever. There's a lot of things that we can talk about, but one is most of the gauge r and only look at two things, and one is repro one element of reproducibility and one of repeatability, but a lot of measurement systems are far more complex than that, and there are several other sources of variation, and so there's something called an expanded gauge r and that allows us to consider multiple different sources of variation to do kind of a better job of really understanding that measurement system. And another issue that we see 
is that a lot of times um, we see the same type of measurement system in a QA lab that is also out in production. So we'll have like the production measurement system, but then we'll have the QA lab measurement system. And sometimes they don't correlate with each other, which is really a problem. So it's supposed to be the same or worse yet, sometimes we're making a component for a customer and the customer might, might be another manufacturer. And the customer wants our performance feature to be within some range. And, and we, so we, we measure it and then we ship it to our customer. But when our customer measures it, they get a different result. So our measurement system isn't necessarily correlated with their measurement system. That's another problem. So again, we want to make sure that we address all these issues up front so that we can have in data integrity. So moving on from measurement system assessment, I want to talk about SPC, statistical process control. So statistical process control actually came about in the 1920s. And it came about at a time when uh, manufacturing systems were rather simplistic compared to um, how they are right now. But basically what it is, it's a way of monitoring our production and making sure that we can detect statistical changes before we're actually making stuff that is out of spec. I mean, anybody can simply take measurements and see whether they're in or out of specification. And that's not the purpose of SPC. The purpose of SPC is to detect statistical changes to make sure that we're catching things before we have a problem on our hands, before we're making inadequate product. Um, the other thing that I hate to say this because it's going to be depressing to everybody, but um, I specialize in failure. And so one of the things that I do for a living is I look at failed garbage. I mean, sometimes my office looks like a kind of a, a junkyard. Um, and so what happens is when I look at what causes these products to fail, because a lot of times I have to do expert witness work and I have to testify in court as to what caused these failures, what I find the majority of the time is these failed products met all specs. Mm. So we have a big problem in engineering. Um, so here we have a lot of products failing um, and they're in spec. And then, so the question is, why does that happen? I mean, I can give you an example. Suppose that um, I'm an engineer and I go out and I tell manufacturing, you know, here's the spec on this angle. My angle has a spec from here to here. Well, a lot of times manufacturing is going to say, what? That spec? That's so tight. You think we're going to hold that tight spec with this old equipment? No way. And so what's going to happen is we're going to start negotiating the spec. And maybe the spec gets opened up because manufacturing is saying we don't have capable enough equipment to hold that spec. And so a lot of times things like that happen. Specs get opened up or sometimes the specs were never in the right, ra uh, right range to begin with, or sometimes we have a spec that somebody set 15 years ago and that person is retired and we don't know where it came from. So the idea okay. is I don't wanna rely on just meeting spec because I don't have 100% confidence in specs. So instead what I wanna do if I'm in manufacturing is I wanna see while things are running and stable, if you look at the chart here, it looks like the process is kind of running in a stable fashion. It's kind of just varying up and down around this middle line here with um, nothing kind of, you know, spectacular out of the ordinary going on. But if for whatever reason, the dot started running kind of up, you know, up higher and they just kept being higher than average, higher than average, higher than average, higher than average over and over again, that would represent a statistical change. It appears that the process is running at a different average. Now, all the parts might still be in spec, but because all of these dimensions are running at a different or whatever, it doesn't have to be a dimension, it could be a constituent or an ingredient in a formulation, but because it's running at a different level, the behavior of that product will be different. Now, whether or not it's noticeable to a customer, that I can't say, but very often it is noticeable to a customer. And so even though those dots might be in spec, they are behaving differently than what we were making before. And then very often that'll be noticeable and that's not a good thing. And so the purpose of SPC is to detect those statistical changes. And that way we can find out about problems before we're making non-compliant things. We can also figure out what caused the change because, because I've got time on this lower axis here. I know when in time, a statistical change occurred. And so it's gonna be pretty easy for me to figure out, oh, was it that a new batch came in? Or, oh, was it that all of a sudden we had a change in the environment? Um, so it's gonna be making um, learning a lot easier. 
as well. It's also going to give me a tool for understanding how much error or noise or variation is normal versus what would be a variation that is beyond what I expect. Um, so it's really a preventative tool and it is a tool that is so easy to use when it's done correctly. Um, yeah. Sometimes I get depressed that it doesn't yeah. <laughs> Well, don't get depressed. But you know, that does bring up a good point. Um, you know, uh, you, you brought it up a little bit earlier where, where you said, hey, the, the, the quickness to be able to respond to these things while they're being uh, produced or processed is, is really key. And so when you have tools like this that you just saw, the SPC chart, the XBAR and R, right? Um, it, you know, when you have automatic, you know, if you have software that says, hey, you hit a run rule, like, hey, run rule five just pegged, right? And you can, you can notify operators with a task to inspect something really quick. That's where you're going to be able to see a lot of um, uh, improvements while it's still on the line. You know, think about having that big run for the day go through. You've got uh, your pallets at the end. They're getting, sh they're getting um, wrapped up. And only then you find out something happened and you got to unbox and check things out, right? That's, that's the killer, right? No customers want that. Nobody on the plant wants that. So um, very, very fun. I uh, love this. I wanted to ask a question of everyone in the, the audience, Elise, and I'm going to, it's just going to take a second to pull this up. Um, wanted to just take everyone's sort of temperature, if you will. And uh, I'm going to ask what best describes your current use of SPC to detect uh, uh, significant process changes. So I'm going to launch this poll. What everyone's going to see on your screen at home or in the office um, is a, a couple of answers. I'd like you to just be thoughtful and honest. We're not collecting names. We're not going to share names. We're just going to share a pie chart at the end of this. We'd love to understand how um, you're using SPC to detect these process changes. Um, you know, some people, I figure at least we're going to have sort of the full um, uh, gamut of this, right? So we've got 36% of people voted. Any guesses on which one of these four will stand out the most above the others? Oh, if I have to guess? Yeah. Um, I am going to guess mm, three or four. Um, I'm going to guess three. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm guessing and I'm cheating because I can actually see the end process. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we're going to see a mix uh, between the first two and that last one. You know, I think that's the real, the real oh, thing is you're wow. either using it, and I'm going to go ahead and close this poll here and launch it. We're going to share the results. We usually typically find when we talk to our uh, customers, they're somewhere in the middle of, hey, we're you doing this, but it's hard, right? So what we oh, usually wow. find is that manual paper check, spreadsheet, stuff like that, that's going on, you, you're checking the box. We're do, do, do you do SPC charting for your process control? Of course we do, customer or prospect XYZ, but it's hard to get it right if, uh, if it's manual. Any, any thoughts here, what you're seeing? Wow, no, I mean, I'm a little bit surprised. This is kind of cool. Um, but uh, I guess there were a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Um, so that's for sure. It was, I mean, 74%, I would say, we have some pretty big opportunities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we'll hide this. I think that that's precisely the point. And that's why we, uh, we're we covering this topic. It is such a hot topic right now, SPC. So um, why don't you go on to just the principles are, uh, 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 Dr. Sure. So first of all, um, yeah, the one thing that I love about SPC is that the focus is on prevention, not inspecting and just finding stuff. It's we want to prevent problems altogether. And it's a great tool when it's used properly for doing that. Another thing that I have to say is, um, you know, there are a lot of different types in modern day charts that people are not using, um, like the three-way charts where we divide uh, variation up into within group variation, between group variation. There are tabular Q sums for um, flow process and things like that. There are a lot of modern day charts that I don't see people using that are far more relevant for modern day production systems. So um, one, there's kind of a weakness even when we do see it used that it's not necessarily used to the best potential that it could be. Um, so when, when it comes to trying to make predictions about how our products are going to perform or how our processes are going to perform, we can only do that when our processes are stable. So if we don't even know whether our processes are stable, and the only way to know that is to be doing proper SPC, um, then it would be pretty impossible to make predictions about how our processes or products are going to behave. So it's really a, a very key thing um, to be doing SPC. 
Um, and then basically, if we do an effective job of SPC, and we have minimized variation at a, at, a, at a good level, then we don't even have to rely on inspection anymore, um, which is, you know, inspection is very costly and uh, it also doesn't really do anything to improve quality. It's just looking for the garbage. So as, as Dr. Deming, probably any of you in the quality field know who, who Dr. Deming is, um, but he was one of the pioneers in quality and basically the three things. One is he says management is responsible for quality and I completely agree. If we don't have the right tools in our plants, um, and in engineering, um, it, that's really management's fault. And quality cannot be achieved by inspection. I mean, inspection is just looking for the garbage. Um, mm -hmm. So that doesn't do anything to improve quality. And then statistical methods. And in, in, in particular, I would say industrial statistical methods are required to understand and control processes by minimizing variation. And I think our education system might be a little bit weak in that area. So the purpose of SPC is to let us know when things have changed statistically so that we can figure out whether it was a change for the better or for the worse, and we can learn what affects our processes. Um, it might be that the changes are still within spec, but because they're statistically different, our products will perform differently and we, it, it might actually be noticeable. And, um, and then note that uh, the appropriate method to assess whether products will meet spec is not SPC. If we're interested in figuring out what proportion of our products meet spec, that's a different toolbox called process capability analysis. So we'll talk about that shortly. All right, so what it means to be in control, the definition is the following. Imagine that um, I'm over here in time, and so I've got time kind of going into the screen here, but at a moment in time, this is the distribution of measurements that I get. So where the curve is tall, I got lots of data points or measurements in that range, and then where the curve is low, I didn't get as much data. So this is kind of a typical distribution. Maybe this is like run out data or backlash or a leak rate, and um, so basically, if that's the distribution that I see when I take some data, let's say at 10 a.m. on a Monday morning, if I were to go back Tuesday at 4 p.m., and if I see the same distribution of measurements, then by definition, the process is in control. So if I keep seeing the same distribution of data over time, by definition, the process is in control. That doesn't mean it's good, but at least it's very predictable. Now, out of control would look something like this. The first couple times I look like I, I look at the data, it follows a curve like this. But the third time I go and I look, it, if it follows a different distribution, then by definition, the process is out of control. So whenever the distribution of measurements change, then by definition, it's out of control. So even if I had a lower spec way down to the left of the slide, um, and then the upper spec way over to the right bottom so that everything was in spec, the process would still be out of control because the distribution of measurements is changing. And then products that come from, let's say the first two curves here would behave differently, let's say, than the products coming off of these three curves over here. Now, again, it would be different. How different? Well, that is hard to say and whether or not it's noticeable to a customer is hard to say. So in SPC, um, they're basically things that we want to look at. And one is we want to make sure that we monitor where we're running on average. And then we use another chart or charts to understand variation. And so we just kind of want to understand uh, how much variation do we have? Is it getting worse or better? And then where are we running on average? So kind of that's the idea. The idea is also we don't have to look at everything. And so what we do is um, we let the process run. And then at some point in time, we reach in and we grab a sample. And that sample is gonna give us like a little snapshot. So where you see the little yellow here, that's like gonna give us a snapshot as to what's going on at that moment in time. Then we're gonna let the process run again, and then later on get another snapshot. Now, if that second snapshot is pretty consistent with what we saw earlier, then again, we might conclude the process is in control. But if the snapshot looks radically different, at least statistically, than what we saw earlier, that gives us a heads up, uh-oh, something has, in, has changed in between. And let's, number one, double check that, you know, are things for the better, are things for the worse, and, and what would have caused that? So that's the idea behind SPC. So I'm gonna kind of move onward. Um, key aspects of SPC implementation. So the first thing is you cannot monitor everything. There are way too many variables um, that, that, you know, millions of things that affect our products and processes, and we can't monitor millions of things. So we have to really understand what matters. The other thing is choosing the right chart. So again, 
uh, modern day production systems are very, very different uh, than things back in the 1920s. And so there have been a lot of SPC charts that have been developed over the decades that most people are unaware of, but they're highly relevant for particular types of manufacturing systems. Um, so if I've got like multi-spindle or multi-cavity or um, a continuous flow, those are all kind of radically different than some of the things that the traditional SPC charts um, were meant to cover. We have to really understand the difference between spec limits and control limits. They're incredibly different. We have to make sure that we're using effective sampling strategies. So how we physically sample is critical. And again, that is dependent on the kind of manufacturing process we're looking at. Selecting the right sample size. There is no magic sample size. Um, if I have a process with minimal variation, I might only need a tiny sample size to learn and see what's going on. But when I have a process with enormous amounts of variation, I might need a much larger sample size in order to detect things. So um, there is no magic sample size. Again, it depends on what it is I'm looking at, what kind of process and how much variation I have. Um, Again, we'd love to automate SPC where appropriate and also empower operators so that they understand what's going on in their process and that they can control the process instead of the process controlling them. So anyway, um, those are some of kind of the uh, key important things with SPC. Now I'm going to move into process capability. Now capability is something different. That is how well do we meet spec? And it is all about estimating what percentage of our products are going to be out of spec. Um, that's what process capability is all about. Again, using effective statistical methods by first understanding our data and what kind of curve describes our data. So this might be something called a gumbel distribution. Um, this is not a bell-shaped curve. A lot of times I see companies just assume that data follows a bell-shaped curve. Um, I hate to admit this, but in my experience, which is a lot of decades and thousands and thousands of data sets, uh, the majority of data sets are actually not bell-shaped. And that's not because there's something wrong with them. That's because a bell-shaped curve goes to negative infinity and positive infinity, and it is symmetric. But if I talk about a characteristic like a leak rate, a leak rate can't go to negative infinity. The smallest leak rate I could have is zero. Let's suppose I'm measuring volume per minute, like cc's per minute. That's how I'm measuring my leak rate. Well, you can't have less than zero. So clearly a bell-shaped curve that has area under it in the negative land wouldn't be effective for describing leak rate data. Also, my clients try to make components that don't leak. And so what's going to happen is hopefully they're going to get a lot of leak rate data very close to zero. So piling up a little bit above zero, but mostly close to zero. But the question is, how high could a leak rate get? Well, <laughs> arbitrarily high. There's nothing stopping leak rate data from getting high on the high side. And so typically what we'll see is a distribution that kind of has a skew to the right. That's very, very common. Um, and so assuming bell-shaped data is very, very dangerous. Um, and there are a lot of other things that we need to learn. But um, the first thing I want to kind of distinguish between is stability and capability, because a lot of people get them confused. We use SPC to address stability, and then we use capability assessment for capability. But there are four possible situations. If I've got time on this axis, and I look at the distribution over time here in the um, upper left, I can see the distribution is staying the same over time, so the process is stable. But because I see that the distribution is extending beyond the specs, I can see that we're not capable because some of the products are out of spec. So here's an example where we're stable, but we're not capable. So obviously stability does not imply capability. Here's an example where so far the distributions have been within the spec, so they've been capable, but the process isn't stable. Um, and a lot of companies think this is okay, oh, everything's in spec, we're good. But I would disagree with that because these products in the second curve will behave differently than these products in the third and fourth curves. Um, whether or not it's noticeable, that's up for debate, but they will be different. It's just how different. So anyway, this is kind of a review of stability does not imply capability and capability does not imply stability, and we need to address both. And we have two different sets of tools to do so. Okay. So I am going to jump um, into 
um, well, I guess I, I should probably go back and say this. Before we do a capability assessment, we must have a stable process because we're trying to assess how much are going to be out of spec. So like if I go back for a minute and I show you this uh, out of control process over here, if I had an upper spec off to the right, can you guys see my mouse? Aaron, yep. can you see my mouse? Okay, yep. so if I had an upper spec here and I was trying to assess what proportion would be out of spec, the question is, what distribution do I use? Do I use this one or this one or this one? I mean, I can't make an assessment because the distribution keeps changing. So I can't estimate what proportion would be out of spec. And even if I could, what's the process even gonna look like next? I have no idea. So if I look at this left picture, and this is an in-control process and I had a spec here, here I can assess what will be out of spec because the distribution is staying the same over time. And um, that, so here I can do it. So one requirement of doing a good process capability assessment is I have to have stability first, but that means I'm doing SPC. And then the other thing is I have to also know what kind of distribution I'm looking at. Um, a lot of people use these capability indices, the CPs, CPKs, PP, PPKs. I have like days worth of discussion on those. Um, I'm not a fan of those at all um, for so many reasons, um, but they are somewhat indications of where things might be running, although we have a problem here. If you look at these two curves on the left and the right, um, let's say these are two suppliers that could be supplying us with the same spec. And both of these suppliers have the same PPK or CPK. And to me, what's disturbing is this left supplier has almost no variation and this right supplier has a ton of variation, but they have the same capability index. So for me, capability is more about estimating what proportion of product is out of spec and measuring variability, because then it would be very clear, this guy has way less variation than the right guy. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, I have a lot to say on capability, but again, moving right along, we can do a capability assessment, whether our data is bell-shaped or not bell-shaped, it doesn't matter. Um, if you have good software, and there are many, many software packages we can use, we can calculate what kind of um, PPM levels, defect rates to expect, no matter what kind of distribution that we're looking at. So now, um, moving along a little bit, um, we can use a lot of these ideas um, if we're trying to optimize, let's suppose, target weights in uh, beverages and food uh, manufacturing. Um, so basically, you know, we can say you know, when we look like this, you know, what is the probability of being below, let's say, um, our maximum allowable variation spec? And we can basically look at um, if we were to improve so much or reduce our variation so much, you know, what would that do to risk? And so basically we can figure out, you know, we want to try to minimize how much we fill so we can be more profitable, but we want to also minimize the risk of having underfills. So we can use a lot of these methods in things like filling operations and things like that. All right, moving along, and somehow, there we go, my favorite topic, which is design of experiments. Design, so I've, I've done, oh my God, hundreds and hundreds, if not over a thousand uh, DOEs in the real world. And the reason that they're so popular with my clients is that is the fastest way to learn. Um, not only is it the fastest way to learn and problem solve, it is the fastest way to get through R&D and develop new products while minimizing risk. So it's a very efficient approach. Um, and the key to DOE is that they produce predictive models that describe cause and effect relationships. So if somebody says they did a DOE, a designed experiment, and they didn't get an, a, a predictive model well, to me or predictive models, to me, that wasn't DOE. DOE is all about predicting um, performance of our products under an infinite number of scenarios. And why DOE is, is so effective is that we can use it to understand the effects of controllable variables and actually noise variables. And we can also understand complex interactions that we would never learn about just by using trial and error approaches or by simply changing one factor at a time to try to learn. Um, so basically, design of experiments is um, a really quick way to identify which factors and interactions, and interactions are really critical, um, influence key product performance requirements. Um, it also helps us understand which factors do we really need to pay attention to and which can we kind of not need to pay so much attention to because we don't have all the time and money in the world to be monitoring everything and controlling everything. So we really need to figure out what really matters and what's not so important. Um, 
The beauty of DOE is that we're going to do only a finite number of setups. And with that, we're going to develop predictive math models that will allow us to predict performance under an infinite number of different combinations and environments. Um, that's the beauty, is that we only have to do a limited number of things to be able to predict performance under an infinite number of requirements. And then the other thing is that I use it for optimization. That's my specialty. So we use DOE and these predictive models to help us hunt down optimal solutions and where we need to spec things in order to get adequate performance on all of our uh, product uh, performance requirements. So where is DOU useful? Well, it can be useful in trying to figure out what are the key characteristics that we should be paying attention to, uh, both on the design side and in the manufacturing side. It can also be useful for understanding how to reduce variation. Now, where I use it the most is for setting specs, both on uh, product parameters, but also setting specs in production, like what cycle time specs should we have? What should the um, line speed requirements or specs be? So I use it for setting specs both in product design and in manufacturing. And then also we can use it to understand how much variation can we tolerate before we start to lose performance in our product and or processes. Somehow I am not advancing. I think it uh, did. Are you talking uh, about what is DOE useful? Is that where oh, you're at? Oh yeah, this is another slide. Yes, thank you. Yep. <laughs> so um, yes, determining how multiple process variables interact with each other. So dependencies of variables on each other to affect performance. That's really complicated and it's something that we never observe in naturally occurring data. And so it's something that we have to get out of DOE. Um, another thing is finding robust solutions. A lot of times what happens is we develop a product, we put it out into the marketplace and usually the product works okay. Unfortunately, not in all environments. So let's suppose that I have an architectural product and it works great almost everywhere unless I happen to be near a saltwater body. And if I'm near a saltwater body, all of a sudden, let's suppose I'm getting premature corrosion in my architectural product or something like that. And so what we wanna do is we wanna try to make sure that we find uh, robust product parameters, meaning we want to make sure that our product is going to work in all of the user environments, not just some, even, even the harsh ones, if that's going to be a big enough market segment. Now, DOE is also useful as a problem solving tool. So sometimes when it's difficult to solve a problem, we can use DOE for that as well. Um, I'm going to jump because you guys can always, you know, read the DOE is useful like all over the place. But one thing I just want to understand is uh, the key idea of interactions. And um, the, the key idea behind interactions is the following. A lot of times people will do uh, an experiment. This is an example here where we're doing an experiment to minimize distortion. And so what we have on the vertical axis is distortion and distortion is bad. So the lower, the better. And let's say anything above 0.4 is terrible and the less we are under 0.4, the better. And so we did an experiment where we had a bunch of variables and the ones that were statistically important and we're mold temperature, glass temperature, and pack time. And so if I look at the mold temperature graph, it seems to say that as we increase mold temperature, we increase distortion. However, this is not where we should be ending up. And the reason is, is that life isn't that simple. Now, when I show you guys this graph, I've got mold temperature down here again, and over here I have distortion again. But this time I'm showing a different story. Um, the black line is what happened in my experiment when glass temperature was at 25 degrees C. And what we can see here is when the glass temperature was pretty cool, mold temperature actually doesn't have a dramatic effect on distortion. Oh. However, when glass temperature was hot, it was 105 degrees C, now all of a sudden changing this mold temperature has a huge impact on distortion. And so I can't just go back here and say, oh, increasing mold temperature increases distortion, because that's a lie. Mm -hmm. Really, what I have to say is the effect that mold temperature has depends on where glass temperature is. And I can actually mitigate its impact if I run cold glass. So this is some of the stuff that we pull out of DOE. And I'm going to end it by showing that when we do these very inexpensive experiments, the deliverable are predictive models. And so here I can actually predict 
distortion. And here is the math model that I can get out of DOE. So I can put in any glass temperature, any mold temperature, any pack time, any glue thickness, and actually predict distortion or work it the other way around. I can actually say, I want to minimize distortion. You tell me, where do I need to run the glass temperature, the mold temperature, and so on and so forth in order to minimize distortion. And not only can we do this for one performance requirement like distortion, but I can develop math models for all my product uh, performance requirements and use a technique called multi-response optimization, where I try to simultaneously optimize all my performance requirements. So Anyway, I am going to kind of end with this. This is an example of trying to simultaneously optimize several things, but I'm going to end right now so that I can open it up for questions. Um, so Aaron, I'm going to send it back over to you for questions. And thank you. If you have stayed on and not fallen asleep, um, <laughs> thank you so much. We, we haven't <laughs> lost anyone, trust me. I think this is fantastic. And what, what this really shows me is a couple of things. So. I hadn't really thought of the independent variables working together like you just showed. Um, we, we tend to think of, especially like when we're you making our things or pro, you know producing our things, we've all got our area, right? I work on yes. line one in the middle of it, and I I've got I've got I've got to do this one check here. Well, it's the whole system that really yes. works together to produce the quality, which I think is still just the the most brilliant. Um, uh, definition of quality I've run into, which is just, it's a closeness to target. And I think that's great. So um, I, I, I'd add one thing to this whole mix. We're getting very um, innovative in our approaches to being able to surface this kind of data to make better business decisions that impacts your overall business performance and even your revenue and margins. These things right now may be just kind of in our offices and we're working on them because it's our uh, calling, it's what we get paid to do, it's our career. Yes. More and more the C-suites, right? Upper management is starting to look at this stuff as better ways to produce better quality and improve profits. So this stuff is definitely coming along and I love this. So. Um, the, the one of the other points I'd make is you talked about how you're getting, you know, the the uh, methods of doing your testing and things like this. Remember, there's always going to be two, no matter what you're doing, if it's discrete manufacturing, process manufacturing, you're going to have two main data sets that you're going to be playing with in general. Things that a, a human collected, right? They tested the temperature, they measured the width of a tortilla, they whatever that is, right? Somebody had to do that. And then the machines uh, you know, with opticals or temperatures, you know, automation. So the machine data and the human collected data have to work together very well and be standardized for this to really uh, be effective. So um, this is super, super, I'm loving it, right? Um, so thank you so much. We do have a bunch of questions though. So let's just get right yes. over to it. So, yeah. Um, the first one, um, I think, you know, the 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 first one somebody says is is it better to do <clears throat> excuse me one big experiment or a sequence of smaller ones to quickly learn that's a great question. So um, first of all, it is definitely better. I had a slide and I skipped over it because I was running short of time, but it is better to do a sequence of smaller experiments. Um, and it, here's the reason. Can something go wrong during a, an experiment? And the answer is yes, a lot can go wrong. So if I've put all my resources into one giant experiment and then something goes wrong, I've lost everything. And so it's much more effective to do a sequence of experiments. And somewhere I have a slide where I talk talk about um, maybe doing a screening experiment where we want to just put a lot of variables or factors in there and then kind of just figure out what probably matters and what doesn't or where is it obvious to set certain things and then we would follow it up with another small experiment where we try to build up knowledge and develop decent models and then finally um, maybe an optimization DOE where we just really kind of home in on um, really really precisely where we need to be so in my experience usually we can actually get really decent with just just a sequence of two experiments. Once in a blue moon, it might take three, but it's definitely more effective to do a sequence of smaller experiments. Um, and the kinds of experiments we do are also, we should be using the right kind. There are a lot of bad experiments out there and a lot of experiments that are gonna be a waste of time and not let us learn. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. That's that's similar across uh, uh, functions and so forth. Um, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And it gives you the ability to step back one step instead of go, oh man, you know, and say, hey, we missed something here. Let's rerun the experiment very small in a small way, or take one step back and go, wait, we're we're looking at the wrong thing. So small experiments, uh, I call it daisy chaining them. So yeah, very good. So one quick question, at least. We, we often when you start to do uh, control charts, SPC charting and stuff like this, there's two terms. There's uh, upper and lower spec limit and upper and lower control limit. Do you want to just right. talk about between those two? Yes. OK, so spec limits, those are simply where usually they apply to individuals. Once in a while in pharmaceuticals and medical devices, they apply to averages, but usually they apply to individual um like a, a part dimension uh, or a part co constituent. And we have to be within there. That has to do with compliance. So um, for the part to meet the spec that it has to. Now control limits apply to statistics. Control limits are not set by a human being whereas a spec limit is. Specification limits are set by an engineer or a regulatory body um, and tell us where we have to be. Control limits, on the other hand, are not determined by a human. They're determined by data and where the the particular characteristic tends to run. And so a control limit is calculated. That's number one, based on data, and it tells us where things tend to be. But it usually applies to statistics. So if I'm doing a chart of averages, the control limits would tell me where do I expect averages to fluctuate between when the system is behaving the way it typically behaves. Or if I'm doing a chart on standard deviations, um, the control limits tell me where do I expect standard deviations to stay. So mm -hmm. control limits are calculated and they usually apply to statistics, whereas spec limits are not calculated. They are uh, dictated by a human being and they tell us where every individual component or unit needs to be. Does, yep. I hope that answers it. Yeah, absolutely. No, and it's it's important. I think that you know it, one one consideration too for for the the woman that asked was is you can overlay them too. I mean, if you've got a control limit. Oh no 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 no. So oh, I, I, no sorry. no no no. So here here's why not. Um, I wouldn't overlay them because usually we're plotting statistics like averages, and so the control limits would apply to averages. Um, spec limits usually apply to raw data, and um, so so usually it's apples to oranges. Averages have much less variation than the raw data does. And so we shouldn't uh, mix them up or put them on the same graph if possible, because yep. um, yeah, because averages remove a lot of the variation. And so we don't see the variation when we're looking at averages, but we use averages to detect changes quickly, whereas yep. spec limits look at raw data. So it's bet like, yeah, so you're, you're back on the, you just had it, the um, X bar chart. Mm -hmm. That's yep. a chart of averages. And if the averages would have fall between this upper and lower control limit, the raw data, the individual measurements would fall way beyond here because individual measurements always have more variation than averages. We okay. teach that in our basic SPC class. We teach a lot of classes where we learn yeah. the difference between how statistics behave versus raw data. And, this is, this is yeah. why you don't want a fool like me running this stuff. So what I guess if you were to put that in an uh, applied way, so let's say we've got um, we've got a fill line, we've got a, a, a limit, a, a spec limit of we need to hit 12 ounces to fill that can of soda, right? Yeah. And you're running your checks. And what you find is you're well within your, your, your spec limit. Uh -huh. um, but when you look at the control, there's room, like you're overfilling, right? This is one of those classic examples of where um, um, process manufacturing can improve with the visibility to that SPC, right? So how would you okay. recommend looking at, like, if you, you think you can tighten that spec limit? Okay, so yeah, wait, so hold on. So, 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 Aaron, what's one thing that you said is okay, so suppose we're running like this, and all of a sudden we get a, a, an average because X bar means average. We get yep. one over here. That doesn't mean we're making anything non compliant, it just means we're seeing an average that is different than what we see historically. And it could be that all the individual units that made up that average were still in spec, they were still mm -hmm. compliant. But what it does mean is that our, our process shifted to a larger value. So we might still be compliant, but we're running differently. And it's important to understand that long before we're making stuff that isn't compliant. That's really yeah. the idea. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got, okay, so you did say something that was really fun and I caught it and it looks like Holly did too. She says, you mentioned C CPK may not be the most effective method for evaluation for a stable process. What would you recommend in place of CPK? Yeah, so what I recommend is it, actually, if we could go to the slide, that, yeah, that one, you just had it. It has the um, kind of um, computer output not this one, but the one after this, yeah, this one. So what we see here is, let's forget for a minute the PPK, CPK. What we see here is an estimate of what the distribution actually looks like. And if you look at um, the, where it says the um, P expected overall performance PPM level, this is an estimate around, let's say 2200 PPMs. Um, so this is an estimate of what proportion of our uh, stuff would be out of spec. And actually just understanding how much variation we have and what to expect out of spec, in my opinion, this picture is far more valuable than the PPK number. And the reason is, is if you go to the next slide, I don't know if you're, you're going to do it, Aaron. Yeah, yeah. Not, not this one. The one that had, maybe it's the one before, the one before. If you go to um, this one, this, just by using a PPK value, that you were, you were there, the, the two blue curves. Yep. If you go That's and you it. look at the two blue curves, um, mm -hmm. both of those have the same PPK except they're very, very different. And so I think sometimes these PPKs can be very misleading because they don't show us the variation. So I'm um, not this slide. Somehow I'm seeing the wrong slide. Oh no, let's see here. I think yeah, you should- The one that had two blue curves and it, it said both both the, um, but yeah, that, that one. So the, the PPK of the left process is actually one and the PPK of the right process is also one. Um, and so it has to do with the way the PPKs only look at your worst half of your process, either the yeah. lower half or the upper half. And because the lower half of the left one is butting up against the spec and the lower half of the right curve is also butting up against the spec, the CPK or PPK only look at your worst side and then based on that, they say, how close is your lower spec to your average? And that's your PPK. So in both of these examples, the PPKs are one. But the reason I don't like that is that these two processes have radically different amounts of variation. And it's really unfair that the left guy isn't credited for having a small variation. So in summary, my answer to the question is, I think we should look at the picture that I was originally showing and then also the variation and then measuring what proportion would be out of spec. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good point. And I've never really thought of it like this, by the way. This is interesting because you really do have that. The, the sigma values are, are very, very different there. So Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Blaine asks, here's a good one. Uh, if there are too many variables to do a screening experiment on a process or product design, how does one do a DOE? There's a he with some uh, with a little bit of uh, commentary. Uh, he continues, multiple screening designs might miss interactions and using reasoning to deduce the list to do just one screening DOE has a different risk. Right. It's a great question. And so, um, so there are a couple things. So first of all, there are actually some DOEs um, that really can handle a, right, a huge number of variables. And uh, the Jump software, I don't work for Jump, but um, I'm, just, I'm not trying to promote them, but they have designs like super saturated designs and uh, these custom designs, which actually can handle a very, very large number. So kind of as a really, really kind of major screening, you could try something like that, like a super saturated design. Um, but, um, but Blaine is correct. Um, if you do break it up into different variables in one screening design and other variables in another screening design, he's absolutely right. We will potentially miss interactions. Um, however, um, down the road, we would be getting uh, variables together and seeing interactions. But um, hopefully what would happen is at least one of the uh, variables in the action would have a main effect that would be pulled out of a of a, of a screening design. That's kind of the hope. But yeah, there would be risks no matter what we do. Um, so there's no like perfect answer. But I would look into, if you do really have huge numbers, I would look into some of the super saturated designs or some of the other tools that some of the software packages offer for handling large numbers of, of variables. Yeah, good, good, good point. All right, well, we have a couple more questions that we're not gonna get to them. We're gonna wrap it up here, Elise, but um, I did wanna make sure everyone understands uh, Beyond Compliance, 
has uh, another one coming up, top 10 auditing mistakes that companies make on September 8th. You can go check out uh, safetychain.com for more information there. But I did want to make sure you guys all had this uh, for integral concepts. Um, you don't call me the marketing guy for this stuff. And I think you guys all just witnessed that in real time. <laughs> Elise, is your, Elise is your person. She's the go-to. Elise, thank you so much for spending the, the afternoon and morning with us. This has been tremendously helpful. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, look forward to uh, chatting with you again soon. Oh, thank you for having me, Erin. It's been great. Thanks so much. All right. Cheers. Uh, that'll end it for us today. I appreciate uh, everyone's time and uh, uh, that'll uh, end us. Have a good day. Thank you.